In the second screencast on pediatric acute abdominal pain, our main objectives are to illustrate the pathophysiology and clinical presentation of two pediatric causes of small bowel obstruction in order to justify the optimal medical care, and two non-surgical causes of abdominal pain in order to establish clinical diagnosis and effectively counsel patients and families. We will progress from newborn to adolescence and address some age-specific considerations requiring urgent or emergent attention. Most urgent or emergent conditions causing abdominal pain peak in incidence at a specific age, which will help determine the likelihood of a condition presenting at that time. The scheme here considers the 0 to 6 month, 6 month to 5 years, and 5 to 18 year ranges as the most distinct. However, within each group there are some conditions that are more common at the younger end, and then decrease in incidence with age, while being gradually replaced by others, which leads to further distinctions at 1 month, 2 years, and at the onset of adolescence. Neonates with abdominal surgical conditions may present in three ways. I focus here on bowel obstructions. High GI obstructions. High GI obstructions are suspected when the stomach or a few bowel loops are distended on the x-ray. These patients often present within 24 hours with vomiting that is often bilious and usually have a non-distended abdomen. Some of the examples of this are listed here. On the other hand, when bowel loops are diffusely distended, we suspect a low GI obstruction, which can occur anywhere distal to the proximal small bowel because of the non-specificity of the neonatal bowel gas pattern. These babies often present a bit later, classically with delayed meconium, vomiting, which may be bilious, and distended abdomens. In both groups, no air will be seen in the rectum on x-ray by 24 hours of age, and shock or perforation can ensue. The most rapidly lethal pediatric bowel obstruction is midgut volvulus, which is a result of malrotation that I will first explain. During embryogenesis, the midgut herniates into the umbilical cord as it grows faster than the embryo while rotating 90 degrees counterclockwise around the axis of the superior mesenteric artery. When this physiological hernia reduces, it rotates another 180 degrees as the future terminal ilium and cecum return to the right side of the abdomen. In malrotation, the rotation is often partial or 90 degrees extra, so that distal duodenum and cecum end up in the right upper quadrant just below the pylorus. Malrotation can lead to two problems. First, congenital adhesions called LADS bands can form during malrotation and extend from the cecum to the liver and can compress the duodenum as they pass over it. More importantly, the proximity of the distal duodenum and cecum allow the base of the mesentery, which normally supports the entire length of jejunum and ileum, to become very narrow. The entire mass of small bowel is thus much more likely to twist on itself and strangulate, thus resulting in midgut volvulus. Most cases occur in neonates. It presents as a high GI obstruction with sudden onset bilious vomiting, and this is why all bilious vomiting in early life is volvulus until proven otherwise. In this setting, fluid resuscitation and immediate surgical consultation are priorities. Imaging may support the diagnosis with an upper GI series showing contrast narrowing in the proximal small bowel, giving what's known as a corkscrew appearance. However, consultation should never be delayed for diagnostic studies as bowel necrosis often begins within hours. Moving on, between one to six months, remember that the GI tract is often blamed for irritability and regurgitation, but physiological reflux and irritable periods are very common at this age and the two may occur together but be unrelated. For instance, you can have colic and reflux, symptomatic gastroesophageal reflux disease, or chasmic allergy presenting this way. While reflux episodes can occasionally trigger vomiting, true persistent vomiting raises concern for obstruction and a variety of disease unrelated to the GI tract. Reviewing diagnoses presenting with abdominal pain between six months and five years. Children are now mobile, so can swallow things they shouldn't and consider the common gastrointestinal conditions as well as extraintestinal infections. Although only 5% of appendicitis develops before the age of 5, it's still the most common surgical emergency beyond 2 years, and also consider Meckel's diverticulitis. Earlier, the surgical emergencies usually relate to small bowel obstruction, and all of these etiologies usually peak in incidence before the age of 1. We will now review intussusception because it is the most common cause of small bowel obstruction between 3 months and 6 years of age. Most cases of intussusception, however, occur before the age of two. In intussusception, one part of the bowel telescopes into an adjacent segment, trapping its mesentery between the two and blocking venous return. The telescope segment becomes progressively engorged with risk for obstruction, strangulation, ischemia, and perforation. 90% of the time, the ileum telescopes into the colon, and 90% of the time, it is idiopathic. Otherwise, a pathologic lead point for the intussusception is found, either due to intestinal polyps or neoplasms, congenital anomalies like Meckel's, or hemorrhage of the bowel wall. Early on, it presents a sudden onset paroxysmal colicky pain, with the infant often looking well between episodes. Episodes then become more frequent, and there is progressive vomiting and lethargy out of keeping with the abdominal findings. 
A palpable abdominal mass may be noted. Current jelly stool only develops after edema and ischemia, so the classic triad of these features is now a rare occurrence. If intussusception is suspected and the patient stable, an ultrasound should be ordered. Here, a loop of bowel within another will appear either as a sausage-like mass or as a donut. For a stable patient with ileocolonic intussusception, emergent reduction is preferred using air or hydrostatic enemas and is about 80-95% to successful. It is important that a pediatric surgeon be available before attempted reduction in case attempted reduction fails or the patient decompensates. Some institutions routinely admit patients following a reduction because recurrence rate is high and will usually occur within the first 24 hours. Finally, the older the child, the higher the risk of a lead point, so consider this in children older than 2. Last, after the age of 5, the differential diagnosis broadens a lot, especially GI tract related causes. Further, functional gastrointestinal disorders, hepatobiliary, pancreatic, genital, urinary, and gynecological conditions all become increasingly common in adolescents. Appendicitis remains the number one surgical concern, followed by torsions and ectopic pregnancy. And while henox shaman purpura, or HSP, is not usually surgical, it has the potential to, so it is included here. HSP presents mainly between 3 and 10, and is the most common pediatric vasculitis in North America. Pathogenesis is unclear, but up to half follow an upper respiratory tract infection. Biopsies have shown IgA deposition and mixed cellular inflammation affecting small vessels, especially in four systems. Skin lesions are most common with palpable purpura, but most commonly involve the lower extremities and buttocks. Clinical diagnostic criteria require unexplained palpable purpura and involvement of at least one other system. Note, however, that in up to 25% of patients, the rash does not appear first. Most patients develop GI tract and joint involvement, with the latter usually presenting as non-erosive oligoarticular arthritis. Renal involvement, usually as nephritis, is the least common of the four, but is most important for long-term prognosis because up to 8% will progress to end-stage renal disease. Short-term GI tract involvement is the most worrisome. Most issues likely result from inflammation, ischemia, or mucosal hemorrhage. The tips of the villi are fed by capillaries, thus the small bowel is most susceptible to injury. Colicky pain is the most common presentation, sometimes with nausea or vomiting. GI bleeding is also quite common, but rarely needs treatment. The most common surgical complication is intussusception, with the majority of cases being ileo-ileal. Perforation, while rare, is usually due to intussusception, so early recognition prevents morbidity. Treatment is mainly supportive. NSAIDs can be used for arthritis, but should be avoided when there is GI or renal involvement. Corticosteroid use is controversial, but is generally not recommended as it may reduce abdominal and joint pain, but it does not prevent GI or renal complications. Counseling is important. Key points are number one, children must be reassessed if they develop severe abdominal pain or frank gastrointestinal bleeding. Number two, the disease is self-limited. But number three, commonly recurs, with almost all events occurring within four months. Last, I wanted to discuss irritable bowel syndrome. IBS is common, especially in adolescents, and can present with acute episodic abdominal pain that is fr quite frequent. So ask about previous episodes, in particular if they have been associated with alterations in bowel movement frequency and or consistency, as well as if the pain is relieved after defecation. These are important for diagnosis, but also help guide management depending on whether pain, diarrhea, or constipation is the most bothersome. IBS is non-organic, but you can be confident in the clinical diagnosis. What I mean is that if the assessment does not reveal any red flags, screening tests are still reasonable, but are not always indicated. Imaging and endoscopy is often low yield and you need to really consider the impact on the patient. Management of IBS can be challenging and should be initiated by the primary care physician. Education about this condition should acknowledge that the pathophysiology is not well understood in everyone, but that many symptoms may be explained by visceral hypersensitivity or motor abnormalities in the GI tract with sensitization or other changes being stimulated or influenced by a variety of medical or psychosocial factors in a possibly genetically predisposed individual. Reassure patients that a disease is not being missed. Stress the importance of regular exercise and returning to normal activities as soon as possible. Although dietary interventions in IBS are common, carefully controlled studies are limited. Diet and symptom Journals can be used to identify individual triggers, or empiric trials can be done 
between two to four weeks in length to assess for symptom response. Laxatives or fiber can be suggested for constipation, and medications of other types could be considered, although addressing psychosocial factors is really crucial as well. This concludes our screencast. Thank you very much.